impulse. Let's see, what could that mean? We're getting such a late start today. Okay. So let's think back to the bullet hitting the, uh, hitting the beach ball, which I'm not going to do again, and I noticed someone didn't come, so I'm a little worried I may have intimidated, <laughs> scared someone out of ever coming to physics again. Um, but we had the bullet flying towards the beach ball, and it hit the beach ball, and the beach ball went off this way, and the bullet went off this way, and bounced back, right, the after. And we decided what must have happened is there was a force on the bullet by the beach ball, etc. So there were forces between uh, the bullet and ball, ball, that's what we saw happen, and the force between them are an action-reaction pair from the third law. So we didn't really explicitly talk about it, I probably said it once or twice, but whatever force that the uh, ball, let's see, this is the ball, no, that's the, oh shoot, okay, we have ball and sphere and bullet and beach ball. Okay, so this is the bullet. And this is the sphere. So we have the force that the bullet applies to the sphere. And that's being applied to the sphere. And we have the force that the sphere applies to the bullet. We're not going to do math in the details. Don't worry about the subscripts. It's an action-reaction pair. Right? The bullet can't push on the ball without feeling the ball push back on it, just like we talked about with Newton's third law. Okay? So now we're going to do a bullet train. Here we go. Okay. Now a different kind of bullet. Now I mean the little star kind of bullet. Okay. So the force of the bullet on the sphere here. Make this say sphere. I should follow my notes. The force of the bullet on the sphere pushes which way? What we would call colloquially forward. Because we shot the gun forward. Okay. Now there's another force. The force of the sphere on the bullet pushes back, right? Now, if they're an equal, if they're an action-reaction pair, what do we know about their magnitudes? Their magnitudes are equal, right? Practice your notation bars around the uh, vector means the magnitude. Magnitudes are equal. All right. Wait, were we allowed to pick up the pledge problems? Yeah, the pledge problems are in the physics office. So go get them. All right. Oy. It's like Morgan and Burks back there. Now, what else do we know? Magnitudes are equal. The opposite direction. These two forces are in the opposite direction. That's a property of Newton's third law, right? So we know they went. Boom, and the two arrows went whoop, like that. Same size, opposite direction, if you were to animate it in some modern teaching method. Where is the physics office? It's in Brockman 2, oh, I'm going to say 9. Second floor of Brockman, the big glass doors and the friendly people behind them wanting to give you a pledge problem. Um, second floor of Brockman. And now, what's the other thing? Okay, so this is from Newton's third law, right? Equal and opposite. But there's another thing that technically has to be true that's not really written down in a law, but it kind of, you know, is the thing that happens, is they're applied for the same duration. Is it really, do they have to be? Yes, right? You can't push this one without pushing back. Therefore, when it starts to push, it'll start to push back. And when it stops pushing, it'll stop pushing back. There's really no way one could be pushing and the other could be not pushing at any point in time. Therefore, they have to follow the same duration, even if they're not symmetric. I had some people in my office asking, what's the deal with the shape of this curve, right? It's kind of like this, but then we said maybe it's like that, and then one of the problems, the book shows it like that. Is that real? They all could be real. The actual detailed force versus time could be all kinds of crazy things. If you had like a spring-loaded toy that doesn't go off until you hit it, you could even have something that pushes real big, and then it goes away, like that. All these things could happen, but... The thing that has to be true is both feel the same force magnitude at the same time. So you can get a lot of different shapes, but each one has to feel the same shape. Right? So there's five, oh wow, we're already five bullets in to this bullet train here. Let's keep it rolling. 
Let's see what else we've got here. Hmm, those are interesting bullets. Thank you. Let's plot. Um, let's go ahead and plot the impulses then. The impulses that relate to this drawing continuing and bullet train continuing here. Let's plot the impulse or the force versus time. We're going to plot FBS, the bullet on the sphere. Okay, so this is zero in time, or this is zero in force, and it'll just happen, right? So what it would be? It would be, well, the force is zero, and then it grows bigger, and it goes in the positive direction. And we always imply that forward is positive. So it's going to look something like this, like I've just been drawing. Oh, like that. So the impulse is just the area under the curve. We can approximate it as a rectangle, et cetera, et cetera. But we have a positive j. Remember, j is a vector. And what was j? j is the impulse. j is equal to delta p. But if we think about the other one, and we're being mathematically consistent, and I know you always want to be mathematically consistent, this is 0. Now we're plotting the sphere on the bullet. So equal and opposite, what would it look like? Uh, it would look like this, because it's the other way. Right? Oh, garbage. There we go. Other way. And now, here's something about calculus, is you talk about how the integral is the area under the curve. Well, if the curve is under the axis, then the area is negative. So the area can have a sign. So this is a negative impulse, if we're assuming the right direction's forward. Right? The sphere pushed back on the bullet in the negative x direction, so the forces are negative, so the area under the curve is negative. It's surely the area over the curve, right? That's what that means. All right. All right, so bullet, here we go. So since delta t is the same, and since the curves are the same, uh, impulses j s and j b, so that means the impulse that the uh, sphere received and the impulse that the bullet received. Right? They both received a kick. Impulse is like a kick. Since the delta t is the same, and since the shape of the function is the same, the impulses are also, also equal and opposite. Hmm, fascinating. So we're just going through this logical procession here, right? Every one of these makes sense and follows from pretty diagrams or laws of the universe. Okay, well, let's say this. Here we go. Okay, now it's about to get exciting. Hold on. Since J equals the change in momentum, delta P, then delta P S and delta P B, the sphere's momentum change and the bullet's momentum change, are equal and opposite, equal magnitude opposite direction. Whoa. Okay, so it's just a really long way of going through this bullets and thinking about Newton's second law to realize delta p's are equal and opposite. Well, if the delta p's are equal and opposite, then we could write an equation delta p s, the momentum kick that the sphere gets, plus delta p b, the momentum kick that the bullet gets, equals zero. Because they're equal and opposite, and I wrote those as vectors, right? Not as magnitudes. But since I put a vector symbol on them, that means that accounts, that includes the fact that one's going in the negative direction. If I wrote them as magnitudes, I would have said PS minus PB, because I know the, the, the bullet got pushed back. But here I'm not putting that information in. I'm writing just a full vector equation that the total momentum change is the momentum change of each one. Together they make zero. Okay. And what does the delta mean? That means before the collision and after the collision, right? The change is during this impulse is when it's happening. So when you put all this... Uh, together, what it means is that momentum is conserved. That's the important thing that we're doing today, or we're starting with. All right? So we have conservation of momentum. Yes? Uh, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to show. We are explicitly going to make that happen before your very eyes. So if we go to the Principia and we translate the third law, we say to every action there's an opposed and equal reaction. 
or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. So then we see the third law is basically saying what we're saying here. So the third law is about momentum, really. So we could argue the first law is about momentum, the second law is about the change in momentum, it takes an external force, and the, the second law and the third law is about conservation of momentum. They're all saying the same thing. Newton's three laws say one thing. Momentum is conserved and it takes an external force to change momentum. It's just saying it over and over again. But when you're the first person to say it, you can say it three times because you know you, it's better to have three laws. It makes you more fast. I think I told you how you gotta get to three. Two laws aren't gonna do it. You gotta have three laws. Okay, so minimum is conserved. Oh my God, I didn't finish the sentence. Momentum is conserved for all objects in an, and here's the part everybody hates, uh, isolated system. Oh, we have to keep up with the isolated system. No. All right, well, we don't have a choice. 